you, Sandy, and uh, thanks to all of you for coming out for this lecture this afternoon. Uh, I'm an honor to be part of the Crossroad Lecture Series, and uh, the topic before us is one that has widespread interest, not only in our neighborhood, but in our country as a whole, and in fact, other countries are watching our process related to the delivery of health care. Uh, let me start right out with a dilemma. Uh, where is our loyalty? Uh, some have suggested that the primary loyalty of physicians and the health care system is to the patient who is immediately before the physician today and have argued eloquently that the physician has should shut out the rest of the world and focus on the patient that is there today and uh, to spare no effort to provide healthcare resources for the service of that patient. Uh, the implications of that perspective are that uh, those expenditures could be quite great and there might not be enough to go around at the end of the day. And so there's a competing position, and that is a societal interest, that the primary loyalty of physicians and the healthcare system should be to the general welfare of the population as a whole. And at times, some services might be limited to individuals in order that other services could be available for all people within the society. And uh, what that implies then is that by taking all of society into account, some individuals may not get what they want or what they need. For example, you may be familiar with the National Health Services in England, and talking to one of the physicians there, he said something to this nature. Uh, we had been discussing Dr. Belding Scribner, a friend and associate of mine, who developed the arterial venous shunt that made renal dialysis available for patients with chronic kidney failure. And uh, growing out of Seattle was a procedure that went on to affect all of the developed world uh, and developing world, the ability to have chronic kidney dialysis. The, this physician said, here in England, uh, to make health care available for all, we have had to put some limits on some services. And what we try to do is to see how we can get the most for our money. And therefore, we do not offer a kidney transplant or kidney dialysis to patients over the age of 55 years. Uh, and he went on to sort of give the reasons that went into that equation. And he said, for some time, physicians like myself simply said to a patient older than 55, I'm sorry, there is nothing we can offer you. What we didn't say is, you're 60 years old, dialysis would work for you, and if you were in New York City, you could get it in a minute. Or that you could receive a renal transplant, but the problem is our National Health Care Service is not paying for those, for patients over the age of 55. So there's a good example, you might say, of how in order to improve the health of society, they have limited some resources for individuals who might otherwise benefit. And that's the true nature of rationing. And that's not cutting out waste or fraud or unnecessary services. True rationing means limiting expenditures that would be expected ordinarily to benefit the person in question. Uh, well, we don't have to go to England. When I arrived in Phoenix a year ago, uh, one of the he newspaper headlines that uh, caught my attention, and it said a second person was denied transplant coverage by Arizona under a state budget cut has died. And uh, with this death, they went on to say, we're expecting that there are going to be more cases of patients who are being served by Medicaid 
who are being denied a transplant. Uh, why? Well, because Arizona thought they needed to spend some money to improve roads, to help education, and to provide for the infrastructure of the state, making sure they had water coming down from Lake Pleasant and so forth. So we're reminded, of course, that health care is one good among many, and it, in a sense, is competing with goods like new highways, or filling chuck holes, or educating our children. <coughs> or, you may have read a few years ago of the Oregon experiment with Medicaid, and here, the part they could control wasn't private insurance, but it was Medicaid. What does, what does the state pay for? And they have a lot of grassroots movement in Oregon where they interviewed people in communities to see what do you prize most highly and what would you give up if you had to in terms of having a list of priorities of health care services. One of the things they decided to give up was organ transplants. Again, this is an expensive service. At that time, it was about $150,000 for organ transplant. Since then, it's gone up and is $180,000 to $200,000 for transplant. And then a person must continue to take medication so that the body doesn't reject the transplant in the years, throughout the years, until the time of their death. So, in Oregon, just to take two examples, um, for People needing a liver, heart, kidney transplant, they simply said, these services, although extremely important to the individual in question, only benefit a few at great expense. And if we have to divide our dollars, we want it to go where we'll do more good. At the early side of life, they also said, and if a premature baby is born weighing 500 grams or less, uh, probably around uh, 24 weeks gestation. Uh, we simply will weigh the baby. If it's under 500 grams, we will not provide any aggressive treatment. We will not intubate. We will not place on the ventilator. We will treat it humanely. We will wrap it in a warmed blanket. We will give the baby to the mother and say, you may want to hold your child. Uh, we want it to be comfortable but we're not going to do any aggressive treatment because we don't believe it would be cost-effective to do so. Okay. So those are examples of limitations that have already been placed. Uh, raising the question then, as we do this afternoon, is healthcare a right? Uh, clearly, I've shown that in some uh, circumstances at least, just citing Arizona and the Oregon experiment, uh, some aspects of healthcare are not a legal right. And now you see I've introduced a new term, haven't I? Not a legal right. The question reframed might be, is health care a moral right? And if so, are there any limitations or how can we innovate limitations that promote justice and social equity in the uh, delivery of health care? Well, it's kind of interesting to ask ourselves the question, how did we get here? How did we get into a place where we're asking such a question? And I think it's interesting. It all began with Hippocrates. Uh, you can go back to the 4th century before the uh, Common Era, and here's a quote from one of the most famous physicians who has been quoted from the time of his own service as a physician, uh, he is still quoted today, and in his book, The Epidemics, uh, <clears throat> he wrote, uh, as, to, as to diseases make it a habit of two things, to help and not to harm. When Beecham and Childress wrote their book, Principles of Biomedical Ethics, in 1979, the first two principles they identified as being relevant to health care are the principles articulated here. And that is, it's, it's, it's common sense that tells us that when one goes into the healthcare arena, that one should be benefited and not harmed. And 
Since some harm is inevitable, the benefit must always outweigh the harm. So even for a simple hot appendix, we have to go into the upper operating room. Uh, we have to have a general anesthetic. Our abdomen has to be surgically open, and then a part of our uh, GI tract is removed, resutured, and sewed back up. And there's always the risk of anesthetic death, uh, the risk of infection by some failure of the uh, antiseptic method, or there's always the danger of catching a bug that lives in the hospital. Hospitals are not exactly safe places to live in, you know, because of the resident bugs that are there. It's not altogether a benign procedure. So we're willing to risk some harm in order to have a greater good. And I think from the earliest times of medicine, even before medicine was very effective at all, this was clearly recognized. In fact, going back, there were two strands of philosophy that related to the nature of health care. The, those who followed the school of hygiene said, well, health is a natural estate. Uh, if you look at children and young people and adults, most of our lives we are healthy. I talked to recently to a 90-year-old man who said, I have never been to a hospital, nor do I plan to do so before I die. <laughs> he was born at home with the help of a midwife. Uh, he had never entered a hospital. And I think he would be the epitome of the idea that we are, we are born healthy for the most part, and by uh, living a prudent life, we can maintain and foster our health. Then there was the second uh, philosophy, and that is the, the cult of Asclepius, and that was quite a different notion of healthcare. In the idea of Asclepius, man is a tool maker, and man has the use of reason, and can use tools reasonably to intervene in the disease process directly. So uh, this uh, woodcut from uh, a French hospital epitomizes the approach of Hygieia, let alone in those days they had three or four people in one bed. Uh, and this uh, particular painting of the surgeon uh, has its roots in Asclepius. So here's the surgeon delving into the body, <coughs> intruding into the body, and he's being watched by the medical students of his age, so they could learn by observing how they might be able to intrude in the human body and eventually to help a suffering patient. <coughs> so <coughs> we have the gradual emergence of a more effective medicine. Uh, looking back, our medical historians tell us that prior to 1935, if you went to your doctor, you only had a 50-50 chance of getting better, which means you had a 50-50 chance of the alternative as well. <laughs> if you go back 100 years before that, going to a doctor was downright dangerous. Many people died post-surgery from shock, there was no anesthesia, from sepsis, there was no antiseptic method, or from loss of blood, or were weakened by bleeding and purging, and there were very few powerful medications, so that uh, the ability of medicine to intervene was of a limited nature. In fact, if we go, if we go back to the time of our first president, George Washington, uh, history tells us that he had taken to his bed, he had his sore throat, he had a fever, he was not feeling well. They summoned the physicians, and the physicians examined him carefully. They wrote meticulous notes, and then they said, uh, President Washington, uh, we have discovered there's an imbalance in the humors of your body, and to restore them, we're going to take off about a pint of blood. And so they did. They took a basin, uh, opened his vein, and drained about a pint of blood. And then they gave him a very harsh laxative with the calomel, with uh, liquid mercury. Well, oh, by the way, the re you always knew when you've given enough of this because the gums begin to bleed due to mercury poisoning. Uh, so they gave him that treatment. And uh, 
For some reason, he didn't improve. <laughs> and so this time, the surgeon came back and bled him copiously. And by figuring this out, they knew that bleeding was usually about a pint, so bleeding copiously would be more than a pint. So by now, he's lost a good bit of his blood. He's not feeling any better. And he said to his doctors, <laughs> you're killing me, please. Let me, leave me alone and let me die in peace. Today's internists have looked at those meticulous records and said, President Washington probably had bronchitis. If they'd given him chicken noodle soup, plenty of water to drink, kept him warm in bed, he probably would have survived his illness. In other words, it sounds like Hygieia, doesn't it? But unfortunately, he was being treated by these Scotia doctors. Uh, who, in trying to restore the humors, their theory of illness, uh, probably contributed to his early demise. Looking back, Galen, who uh, dates back to 129 and who died in the year 200, uh, studied human anatomy sort of indirectly, because in those days, dissecting a human cadaver was forbidden by law. It was a desecration of the human body. And so Galen was limited to dissecting pigs, cows, goats, monkeys, he even did some monkeys. And then he wrote a book on human anatomy based on what he had learned from these other mammals. Uh, and for about 1,500 years, a millennium and a half, doctors were so impressed with the famous uh, physician Galen that uh, they continued to teach erroneous <laughs> notions of anatomy until Vesalius had the courage to say, you know, I've done dissection on human bodies and Galen is wrong. And of course, that was not a very popular statement. By the way, Galen is an, another example of the innovation that's been in medicine. Uh, even before the age of antiseptic uh, or of sterile method, uh, Galen uh, recognized uh, cataracts. And he, along with his uh, machinist friends, developed a very sharp pointed instrument that could go into the eye and take out the cataract. <laughs> go figure, pretty early surgery, right? I don't think we would want it to have been the patient. It would have been a painful uh, process and we might have occurred an infection. But uh, medicine has always been innovative in trying to improve its methods to help people. In those days, of course, they didn't really know any, they didn't really understand the circulatory system. The thing that had not been discovered is capillaries. So we know the heart is the pump, the, the, uh, the uh, blood goes out, it goes to the capillaries, exchanged into the venous system, and returns to the heart. Back in those days, prior to 1628, uh, it was thought that ar arterial blood comes from the heart and venous blood comes from the liver. And that the liver would send the venous blood around the body. And uh, so, when you think about the whole span of the human species, it's only been recently that we've had correct understanding of even how the body functions. And then, uh, just when uh, hypnotism was being used as an anesthetic because it was so inhumane to operate on people with no anesthesia, uh, Morton discovered the usefulness of ether. He invited another physician, oh, uh, he and his wife invited another physician and spouse to dinner, and while the women were in the kitchen, Norton says to this guy, hey, I want to try an experiment, and uh, I need your cooperation. So the guy laid on the couch, he took a little, uh, a little screen uh, covered with cotton gauze, dropped a few drops of ether on it, had the guy inhale, and of course he went to sleep. He stopped, withdrew the ether, the guy woke up and said, hey, what happened? He said, well, you, you've been asleep, you've been unconscious. And now, so that you will really believe me, I want you to do the experiment on me. And explain to him what to do. The gentleman uh, put the 
gauze over Morton's face. He breathed deeply in the fumes of ether and, of course, went to sleep. And the man stopped, and in a few moments he awakened. And that just goes to show that nearly anyone could serve as an anesthesiologist. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was the birth of anesthesia for surgery. And uh, of course, from that point on, surgery proceeded uh, very rapidly because now uh, they could do it humanely. In the meantime, the work of Louis Pasteur, who discovered uh, how to vaccinate people against various illnesses and who discovered the germ theory and the fact that uh, physicians would pass germs from one patient to another. And uh, he had tried various means of pasteurization in milk and was uh, beginning to teach budding physicians about the germ theory. One of his students was Joseph Lister and he really became convinced of Pasteur's, uh, the truth of his message, and he began to insist that surgeons wash their hands before doing surgery, can you imagine that? And he began sterilizing instruments with carbolic acid, and uh, one of his disciples, or, or, or associates, uh, William Halstead, uh, whose nurse and girlfriend, was having rough hands due to her allergic reaction to carbolic acid, he had uh, the other scientists make a pair of rubber gloves for her, and uh, very quickly rubber gloves became the standard for use in, in surgery. Alexander Fleming, uh, a name you'll remember, went off on vacation, and when he came back his lazy lab clerk had neglected to wash the dishes, the petri dishes, that is. And uh, Fleming noticed that he had been doing some experiments with Staphylococcus bacteria, and in these dirty dishes he noticed that mold had begun to grow in a couple of the dishes. And where the mold grew, the Staphylococcus bacteria had died. He thought that was very interesting. So he took some of that uh, mold and he began to culture it and found, sure enough, that mold and byproducts from that would kill any number of bacteria. It took from 1928, when he discovered this, to 1945 to finally synthesize it and make it available in mass production. And voila, we had penicillin, the first antibiotic. And now we were able to intervene in the disease process in rather miraculous ways. So, look at the history. We have a long history ranging from medicine being dangerous, outright dangerous, or ineffective, and then after World War II, medicine emerged as more powerfully effective. Research and innovation has contributed to the rapid rise of amazing array from transplanted organs, uh, one of the recent ones we're familiar probably with uh, putting a stent in the, in the coronary vessels to prop them open in the event of a heart attack. And more recently a team has discovered a way to go into the artery here in the groin and go up into the brain and capture a clot and remove it, thus uh, taking away the risk of a stroke. Uh, medicine, it's, it's amazing. And our life expectancy has changed from 48 in 1900, the turn of the century, to today, 78 in general. Uh, what are we doing with those 30 extra years? Uh, not that people didn't live to the age of 78, 80, 90, or 100 in the past, but very few did. And because one-third of every baby born alive died before the age of 18, the mortality rate was uh, high and longevity was low. Well, today's society faces a different problem. Healthcare offers these amazing benefits. Uh, now, uh, healthcare is universally desired. When we're sick, we want a good physician, and it is not universally available, leading us to the problem of today's topic. Is healthcare a right? Right, according to philosophers, always implies duty. 
In other words, if I said uh, I have a right to see the physician here at the clinic at Orcas Island, but I have no money, uh, how is my right going to be exercised? Or if I said, well, you all should chip in a dollar a piece to help pay for my visit to the doctor. You might scratch your head and say, well, why is it that I should cough up a dollar to help this stranger? Uh, where, does that, where does that claim to having a right or a duty come from? So philosopher has been very clear that no legal right no real right exists unless there is a corresponding duty of someone to meet the need described by that right. A claim right always re requires duty. Now, one of the ways we might explain that would be to say, here in the United States, students from the age of kindergarten to the 12th grade have a right to free, publicly funded education. You remember that when you pay your property taxes, right? Uh, students have a right to a free public education. And that is a right because there is a corresponding duty for us to pay the bill. And that, that uh, duty has been uh, uh, spoken in the law so that we cannot be uh, forgiven from our duty. But what about health care? Is there a claim right to health care? Well, it's very interesting because in our culture, we could say yes and no. For example, if you're over the age of 65, you have a claim right to Medicare, to the kind of treatment policies that are described in the Medicare document. Or if you are below a certain poverty level, you have a right to health care funded by Medicaid. If you are a vet and have had foreign service and you have qualifying factors, you have a right to receive health care in the VA system. Everyone else uh, may be covered by their employer insurance or by private insurance or by paying out of pocket. So, uh, the right to health care as a claim right does not exist universally in the United States as it does, for example, in England or France or Canada, where every citizen is covered with a certain level of health care and does not have to worry about going bankrupt if they have a catastrophic illness. Now, uh, what about our uh, forefathers and mothers when they began to set up this country? Listen to this language in the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men, today they would probably say all persons, are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that it's the role of government to secure these rights for the citizenry, is it not? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Does it mention health care? <laughs> Yet, in a way, isn't health care at times essential for the saving of a life? Liberty and the pursuit of happiness, isn't our liberty to a certain degree ensured by a good health and our ability to pursue those things that equate to the good life by our definition. Or look at the Constitution. In order to perform a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic <coughs> tranquility, common defense, and promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty, ourselves and our posterity, and so forth. Well, in talking about general welfare and in talking about justice, does health care come in there? Not the language, but is there some implication, some notion of implying that there might be instrumental steps in securing these goods? 
Well, even Maslow, for example, in talking about the various stages of self-actualization or man's hierarchy of needs, uh, he, interestingly, he doesn't put health on the triangle, does he? I had to put that in there for him. Over here, health. Uh, maybe it would fit under security, uh, or certainly under the physiological aspect of uh, security. In an ideal society, and sometimes philosophers use this language, not so much what is the current status of legal rights, but what kind of society do we want to live in? Do we hold a basic belief that every human life is of equal value, and that regardless of whether one is rich or poor, male or female, or regardless of ethnicity, that one life is equal to the life of others, the notion of uh, equity and justice. Many agree that uh, an ideal society would be one that provides at least a decent floor of health care for all of its citizens. And that's an appeal then to the principle of social justice. Uh, how might we justify that? Well, the fact is, not all of us were winners in the lottery of life when it came to our genes. Some people, through no fault of their own, inherit a gene for cystic fibrosis, or sickle cell anemia, or Huntington's chorea. And we don't know where we're going to be in the lottery of life and so it seems to beg the question that maybe we should have some form of general welfare that would help those who, again, through no fault of their own, happen to inherit those genes. Accidents are no respecter of persons. And often people are injured in accidents that were not, for which they were not culpable. Uh, how can we, in a just society, provide the greatest good for the greatest number? Well, many argue that these social justice questions invite us to formulate policies intended to ameliorate the lottery of life problems. And that thus far, our society has formulated partial responses, yet lack a comprehensive policy. And that therefore, we have problems with the United States healthcare system. For example, in 2010, 52 million Americans were uninsured. They're at risk. 25 million Americans were underinsured in a 2008 survey. 45,000 deaths annually are attributable to lack of healthcare insurance. People stay away from the doctor because they can't afford to go until they have an untreatable condition. 62% of bankruptcies uh, in uh, 2009 were linked to illness. And most of these medical debtors who went bankrupt were well educated, they owned homes, they had middle class occupations, and three fourths of them had health care insurance. But their own catastrophic illness exceeded the coverage of their insurance program. We have problems. In 2009, we spent $2.5 trillion on health care. Wow, with a bill like that, it looks like we ought to be able to cover everyone, doesn't it? Yeah. However, racial and ethnic minorities tend to receive less and lower quality health care, even when such as insurance status and income are controlled for. Or, uh, Americans in general have poorer health when compared to other wealthy and even some middle to low income countries. Uh, life expectancy, uh, by one uh, figure, we are 46th in the world at life expectancy. Infant mortality, 42nd by some standards. If you want to know where to go to live the longest, I guess you better head for Monaco. Uh, they're the winners at 89.7 years. And you can see where we are. We're down here. We're 50th in the world with an estimated uh, life uh, 
expectancy of 78.37 years. Of course, people would argue uh, that's not the total picture because we're a huge country. We have 300 million people. We have many more automobiles on our highways than most other countries. And people die from automobile crashes. And Americans travel more. We host more immigrants. We've been at war. We've been fighting two wars at once. We work hard to save infants who are born prematurely at 23, 24 weeks. It may cost a million dollars to save the life of such a baby. Our health care is excellent, but variably available, depending on where we live and whether or not we have that insurance. So the question might be, who is responsible? And one claim is, well, individuals are responsible for their own health care, for their own health. It's what your mom taught you. Eat the right food, uh, sleep eight hours, drink in moderation, uh, get, uh, maintain moderate stress, get your sleep, so forth. Uh, things that we all hopefully grow up knowing. Who's responsible? Well, individual behavior is one major component. But as I mentioned, these other genetic factors abound. And we know by doing extensive surveys that in some neighborhoods, there's not a grocery store with fresh fruits and vegetables, but there may be two fast food places, a McDonald's and a Kentucky Fried Chicken, that make it easier for low-income families to seek foods that are not going to be healthy for their family in the long run. People who are educated know uh, good health habits. They know the dangers of smoking, and they inculcate that within their families. Uh, people who do not have good education often do not provide uh, healthy behaviors within the family context. So others would argue, yes, individual responsibility is important, it's essential, but that there are social determinants to health beyond the control of any individual. Uh, again, George Washington wore false teeth, they were made of wood. No one put fluoride in the water. Uh, there are things like fluoride in the water or widespread vaccination, things that are provided today for the general welfare of society that encourage health and discourage illness. Um, and many argue that we should put even more of our effort into the prevention and management of disease uh, rather than on in before we go on to innovate of new kinds of treatment. So it turns out that there are two very important factors, the social determinants combined with individual choice, and then policies that provide quality health care to all. They are difficult to obtain. Uh, when we talk about health care, behind that is the idea that it's not health care that's good, it's health that is the primary value, is it not? Healthcare is one instrumental step toward health. And some uh, researchers tell me that healthcare per se only contributes 10 to 15% to the health of the individual. Uh, so a lot of these other factors we've been pointing to are extremely important. But health, is not only a good for the individual in seeking to live their own good life, but it's a social good and contributes to the nation's productivity and uh, reduces absenteeism and health care costs uh, and uh, may even contribute to having a strong army. There are a variety of instrumental reasons one could argue for it. Health care, a cooperative project organizes finite resources aimed at improving health. But how are such resources to be distributed? We share a common human vulnerability. The principles we've appealed to are those of equity and liberty. We want to be as free as we can to live our own life project, and yet we want it to be treated equally when we're in our hour of need. Our current system of healthcare delivery is not really a system after all. It's a kind of conglomeration of parts. Consider for a moment the case 
that uh, people writing in healthcare is today described as the case of the free writer. Have you heard that term, the free writer? What does that mean? Well, imagine John Doe, uh, 25 years of age, and he chooses not to be insured. And if you ask him why, he would say, well, I make a very modest income, and I like having an apartment with a roof over my head. I need to have a car to drive to work. I have to have car insurance, and gas is $4 a gallon. So at the end of the month, I simply don't have enough money to buy health care insurance. And so I'm going to gamble on the fact that I'm young and healthy, and nothing is going to happen. But unfortunately, John Doe gets in his car, and as he is driving to work, he has also chosen to express his liberty of not fastening his seatbelt, and he's involved in a car accident. Not his fault. Someone else comes through the intersection and T-bones him, but he is taken to the hospital, and one of the first things they do there, you know, is the wallet biopsy. They want to see if there's any green stuff in the wallet. And unfortunately, our John Doe doesn't have any green stuff in his wallet, and he doesn't have an insurance card. So what do we do? Put him on the curb and the gurney? No, because here in the United States we have a, a law, we call it EMTALA law, it's an Emergency uh, Treatment and Transfer Act. In other words, it requires a hospital, if the patient gets brought in, you have to stabilize that patient and you can't transfer them anywhere until they're stable. And John, our, he needs a blood transfusion, he needs surgery in the operating room, and then he needs some recuperation in the ICU before he can go anywhere. And guess what? When all of this is done, and maybe the bill is $75,000, John is not going to pay for it. Why? Well, because his savings account is empty and he has no insurance. And so, who is going to pay for that treatment? Well, the answer is you and I are going to pay. When I go in for my appendectomy or whatever it is I need, I'm going to pay a little more so that the hospital can cost shift some of my surplus payment to pay for those who are free riders, those who do not have insurance. And so, uh, many would argue that there, there's a flaw in our system and that, well, lo and behold, 78 million baby boomers are descending on the healthcare system. And as we all know that as we approach old age, we're likely to need, not necessarily, but likely to need more health care. And lo and behold, we also have a physician shortage. More people coming into health care, less doctors to take care of them. In 2014, just two years down the road, we are going to have a $60,000, a 60,000 shortage of physicians. I think it's about 50,000 now. And by 2025, we will have a shortage of over 100,000 physicians. And you know, it's a long time training up a physician. Four years in college, four years in medical school, three or four years in residency. It takes a decade. So if we started today, it would still be 10 years before we would have a sizable increase. The University of Washington, like others, have increased the size of their class. Uh, 10 years ago, our class had topped out at 175. Now they've increased it to 225, an uh, increase of about 50. <coughs> but it's going to take a while for those to get in the pipeline. And after all, that's only 50 a year. Uh, barely replacing the retirement of older physicians. Plus, we have a maldistribution of physicians. The only, the only physician specialty we have enough of is cosmetic surgeons and dermatologists. <laughs> Plastic surgeons and dermatologists. All the other specialties are a little bit low, but we have a crying absence or lack of primary care physicians. Uh, unlike Canada, for example, who reward physicians who go into primary care and limit the number of specialists. Or countries like Finland, where they have a closer reign on how many can go into specialties in order that 
uh, good primary care, prevention of medicine can be maintained uh, rather than uh, a high increase in specialization. Because unlike other commodities, when there are too many physicians, the price doesn't go down because of competition, the price actually rises. Because people will do more surgery. Well, you need to hit a hip replacement or a total knee. We can do that. And uh, it may be that more unnecessary procedures are done because there are more people who are trained to do that for procedure. So our dilemma, individual patients need quality care. Spending on one, however, limits resources available for other life sufferers. Efficiency in the system is a moral requirement, but efficiency may not be enough. Rationing seems inevitable, that is, limiting some beneficial services to some in order to distribute basic care more equitably. In an ideal society, access to health care would be available to all. Intentional policies would provide for just such access, and we could base that on an appeal to the notion of social justice. It recognizes both individual responsibility and social determinants for well-being, coexisting within activity. Under the rule of law, our society is faced with the challenge of translating this ideal view of a just society into policies that promote equity in access of health care. Is that easily done in today's political climate? <laughs> what have we just witnessed? We must somehow, though, invoke the democratic process by influencing our representatives in Congress to develop and to enact such policies. If, that is, we believe, as I do, that health care is a moral right. Thank you very much for your Thank you, uh, and certainly thank you. Right now, we have an opportunity for those of you to, uh, some of you, to ask your own questions. And uh, the only thing I would ask is that it's a direct question. It's obviously a very political uh, topic, as well as a, uh, a personal topic. So, uh, any questions? Yes. Um, I'm not quite sure I know how to ask this, but I'll try. I suspect that the majority of the people here believe that everyone in our country should have access to health care. What I'm interested in, so I understand how that goes in my head. How does it go in someone's head who does not believe that it that everyone in our country should have access to health care? What, what does that look like? Okay, what Janice is asking is, she understands or she believes that people should have health care. What goes on in somebody's head who doesn't have that same philosophy? Is that correctly paraphrased? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, very good question. Uh, you get right to the heart of the matter right off the bat. Uh, my friend, uh, uh, Tris Engelhart, uh, who is uh, prone to take the devil's advocate, uh, once responded to that question by saying, well, uh, he's a Texan, he goes, the two things I value most are good books and excellent whiskey. And as a free American and a Texan, I demand my right to those. And uh, I'm not interested in uh, buying health care insurance for myself or anyone else. I'll take my chances. <laughs> well, he's kind of giving us the epitome of a very strong libertarian point of view. And that's the idea that essentially each one of us ought to take care of ourselves and we ought to stay out of the business of other people. And it's in contrast to a communitarian point of view that's fostered by some of the ideas I mentioned that uh, I might have a child who is unlucky in the lottery of life. I might be healthy, but I might be a carrier of cystic fibrosis genes and they might express themselves in my child. And my child had no 
you know, she, he or she could not start with a healthy background to begin with. So part of it is this worldview. Uh, is our worldview strictly libertarian? Everybody take care of themselves, or is it? Well, we should take care of ourselves, but we also have an obligation to our neighbor and to those who are unlucky in the lottery of life or in the lottery of uh, genetics. And we ought to all make some kind of contribution to the greater good. So that's the central uh, division between those two uh, philosophies or worldviews. Uh, Jay. Um, tobacco was in the uh, mid-60s pretty well established. Surgeon General said it's going to kill you, but it took several decades to get the taxes in line, excise taxes, to discourage smoking. Mayor Bloomberg recently established some taxes aimed at sugar, you know, trying to address the problem of obesity and so forth. What are the, you talked about the rights and the duties, what's the duty of the individual to be healthy and if they choose not to, what is the uh, society's right to tax or otherwise discourage unhealthy habits? Okay, Jay's question was specifically, uh, he mentioned tobacco, what is our, our right, our, our duty as an individual to keep ourselves healthy before we can assume that health care is there for us? Good. Again, a very good question, uh, Jay, and um, I, I've articulated uh, the need for each of us to take personal responsibility for health. I think that's a, the prerequisite. That's a good starting point. Uh, then it begins to get a little murky. Uh, for example, as a parent, I believe I have a moral duty to teach my children about the fact that use of tobacco is going to be harmful to their health and do everything I can to uh, contribute to them being in a tobacco-free environment. Uh, but we also live in a society that uh, values personal autonomy or personal liberty. Uh, so we've used taxation to make cigarettes very expensive as a way to help discourage people from using tobacco, although we have, and we've forbidden the use of smoking in restaurants and bars and public places, but we haven't gone as far as to outlaw completely the use of tobacco. And I think that's a way in which our society is trying to uh, harmonize a respect for personal autonomy and a contribution to beneficence or at least non-maleficence, that is, avoiding harm. Uh, people ask the question, you know, big, big, big gulps or slurpees may not be good for people because of uh, uh, the problem of obesity and the problem of increased uh, blood sugar and type 2, the type 2 diabetes being rampant. So, uh, how should we address it? Should it be through public education about the need to monitor one's blood sugar, or should it be to outlaw uh, the size of soft drinks that can be purchased in the state? And uh, there are competing ideas about what is going to be most effective in doing that. Uh, one other thing I would add, and that is, suppose I had a conversation with two physicians. One said it this way, if a patient comes to me and the patient is a smoker, I am a pulmonologist, a lung doctor, I foster people with healthy lungs, but if he chooses to injure his lungs by smoking, then I will say to him, I'm going to just tell you once, if you continue to smoke, I'm going to give you the nicotine patch, I'm going to send you a smoke enders program, and if you continue to smoke, I'm going to kick you out of my practice and refer you to another physician. The second doctor said, well, I can see why you feel that way. I'm also a pulmonologist, I want my patients to have healthy lungs, but I've also recognized the powerful addiction of nicotine. 
And I may not be doing enough if I simply threaten the patient to cut them out of my practice if they don't stop smoking. And uh, there is some evidence that some people genetically are more uh, likely to be addicted to nicotine than others. So the person who says, well, I woke up and realized smoking wasn't good for me and I stopped cold turkey. And the other person said, I've tried to stop 30 times. I've used a lot of nicotine patches and it hasn't worked. Uh, maybe that person is a victim of bad genes. And so then the question is, are we going to persecute the victim or are we going to find other ways to help that person find a reasonable solution? Uh, one uh, company, for example, on the smoking issue said, uh, we'll, we'll provide free prescriptions for uh, nicotine patches and we will provide free smoke ender classes and support groups. And if at 60 days the person hasn't stopped smoking, then we're going to cut their tier of insurance. That is, we're going to provide them with a lower tier of care. And uh, it, it's been shown by those who have studied this that that is not an effective way to actually change the behavior. It, it's a kind of form, that said, of punishing the victim without helping them uh, move toward a healthier behavior. So human psychology and human change is a very, uh, very difficult issue. And that's what we're trying to face with. Can we do it through education? Can we do it by legislation? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, another question? Yes, right here. <coughs> you can skip this if you need to. But along those lines, I was thinking of mental health and how there used to be, I don't know how long ago, very awful sounding asylums. And then I was a social worker in the 70s and we had deinstitutionalization. And you know, what, what caused the improvement, I hope, back in the days of no more asylums or, or what? Do we know what changes that? Okay. So we're going to talk about deinstitutionalization. <clears throat> well, what no, changes no. the society's way of looking at a thing? That... Yes, it's true. There, uh, prior to the seventies, there there were uh, some people called them insane asylums. There were asylums that were uh, substandard, and they were not good places for treatment, they were more or less, they warehouse people. Uh, there were some, however, that were very effective, that they had good medical directors, they had insightful treatment, they had compassionate staff. And unfortunately, I think that the closure was not related to the fact that we had improved medication for mentally ill people, so much as it was a way to save dollars. And those very same people now are not living in asylums, but they're living on the street. They say this is our homeless population, and they're not being seen in a mental health clinic. They're in the King County Jail because they've had some uh, minor infraction because of uh, urinating in public or sleeping in your yard or disturbing the bees, that sort of thing. So those mentally ill people are still there, but we've sort of taken them out of the institution and we sort of put them on the street and in the jail. We haven't solved that problem. The World Health Organization talks about health as being not only physical, but mental and emotional as well. And I think that currently uh, we're doing a disservice to many of our mentally ill citizens. Okay, uh, yes. I would go back to the question about the healthcare the moral right and expand it to the possibility that health is a moral right and connect to what the gentleman up there said. Because if health is a moral right, then selling Coca-Cola and cigarettes is a moral sin and should be forbidden. Uh, so the question is, it's outlawed to murder people, but it's not outlawed to murder them solely without them knowing. <laughs> so, um, yeah, absolutely, because our government is up for us to drink raw milk, but it's allowed to sell Coca Cola or Sprint or other junk food and cigarettes and other killing substances that for sure kill us. And, and the question? Related to, uh, I guess, the question.
question is, shouldn't we start there because we're ignoring, we're saying let's, you know, support a system that is actually killing people, ignore that, let them keep killing us and look at down here as we're being killed, mm -hmm. how do we do healthcare and shouldn't we have health is a moral right, which then gives us the right to outlaw killing substances. Okay, in case you didn't hear that, basically the idea is if health is a moral right, uh, what about the people who are selling things that we know to be unhealthy? Is this a moral sin? Did I get it? Is that okay? It's killing people. Right. It's, it's killing people. It's more than unhealthy. Okay. Yeah. It's causing the cost of health care to go up so much, and people knowingly eat stuff. And then the other person says, I don't want to pay for their health care. They know that they're junking themselves and that they cost me more because they're not taking care of themselves. So if we go to the source of why companies have right to poison people. Okay, thank you. Is there any, were there any questions about the question? No, uh, I'll just jump right in and say, uh, of course what you're saying is very important. and. What your, our discussion occurs within a societal context that prizes very highly individual liberty. But that's where they make the distinction between killing me slowly and murder, right? Uh, so some say, well, where do we draw the line? It's actually a line drawing problem. For example, should we should we uh, limit the butcher in how much marbled fat can be on the prime rib or on the steak? Or should we eliminate red meat altogether since it does contribute to uh, coronary artery disease? Where do we draw the line? And I think what we're trying to figure out is how do we respect individual liberty and trying to provide good health education. Now, I think some efforts are being made in this direction. For example, my own insurance company, ah, oh, they discovered that I'm online. So now they send me a health bulletin every month. And they also entice me uh, with things like this. Uh, well, Dr. McCormick, how much are you exercising? <laughs> and if you will log on to your computer every week and show that you've exercised, you know, 5,000 steps a day or whatever, We'll give you a $30 gift card to Amazon.com so you can buy a new book. Uh, that's an example. Uh, the insurance companies are trying to find uh, subtle and small ways to educate and incentivize their insured toward healthier behaviors. And of course, it's on the honor system. But to me, it's a step in the right direction. And towards enabling individuals to wake up and think about their health. We recently had an exercise at the School of Medicine, and I asked uh, students in this group to identify their top six values. And interestingly, in a group of, uh, I think my group was 25, only two identified health. Okay. They talked about education, relationships, family, so two out of 25 identified health. And they're going into a healthcare profession. <laughs> so, after we discussed this, well, I said, well, what were you thinking? You didn't identify health. Oh, Dr. McCormick, I, we're all healthy and I just took it for granted. <laughs> exactly. We may take health for granted. And we may fail to see our culpability in movements toward good health or toward those things that are going to mitigate toward bad health. So, very good question. All right, we have time for a couple more before we have our reception. I've got right here. Yeah, right here. Here. He said he had a long time. All right, you'll get the second one. Right up here. Okay, I have just one minute. I'm here because I've had recent discussions with people who have had accidents. You've talked a lot about delivering health care to people. I have a friend recently who swerved, hit a tree, was flown off, spent a day and a half in the hospital, lots of tests, so forth. I mean, the bill is like 35 grand, right? So you've talked about how to deliver, which is 
two years income for this guy, right? Right. So you've talked about health care for everybody. What do you as a doctor see as something that we can do to make health care cost less? I know in Thailand an equivalent treatment probably would have cost five thousand dollars. Right. Or in this country it's forty thousand dollars. Right. What do we do to get more equitable? Okay, good question. Uh, probably those of you here, unless you recent, had a recent experience in the... Oh, please. Yes, how can we reduce the price of health care in the United States? Because something that might cost $40,000 here in Thailand could cost five. Okay. Sure. So most of us probably know approximately what is the cost of a Ford Explorer or a Toyota Prius. Yeah? But when we go to the doctor and the doctor says, you need an operation, uh, how many of us ask, how much is that going to be? Healthcare is the only field I know of where someone says to you, you need an operation or you need to take this drug, and we say, yes sir or yes ma'am, and we have no idea at all what it's going to cost. Or you've been banged up in a car accident, you need to go to the OR and they're going to patch you up, and uh, we don't ask for what it's going to cost. And uh, so there's no real competition in terms of looking for the best value or the best bargain. So again, the whole idea of there is information out there now through the computer system that will tell us which hospitals have the best results in treating patients with cardiac disease or heart attack and which have the worst records, and which ones cost X amount, and which cost Y amount. And as the public begins to avail themselves of this information, they can have more control over where can I go that has the best price and the best quality in the service that I want. That's what we do when it comes to other, uh, other commodities, is it not? But healthcare is one of those that has not been affected by this very much until now. And so what I encourage everyone to do is when the physician says, I'm going to start you on this drug, I'm going to recommend the total knee replacement, you need a total hip, how much is that going to cost? And uh, what do the competitors charge for that service? Uh, we, we, need, we need to have a, most, a more cost-effective idea. Now part of the problem is also this. If I'm paying for my health care out of pocket, then I'm going to try to get the best bargain, the best bang for the buck, right? But if someone, if my employer says, we're going to cover you and we're going to give you pretty nice coverage, then how can I get more services? How can I get more of what I deserve that is in the form of health care? And uh, I may not question the cost, but that's a mistake because when the cost goes up for me, it goes up for all of you. And if we're all working toward lowering the cost, it, it's more effective. And I'm going to have one more question here. And I do want you to know that there are obviously some other questions in the group. Please feel free to approach Dr. McCormick when you step right outside and enjoy the reception that we have for you. Sir. Uh, I was wondering what you, how you think um, reforming courts Okay, the question had to do with reforming torts uh, and how that would, would affect the price of health care. Correct? Yes, that's, that should be my next lecture. Uh, <laughs> very good question, but it's a very important question. Uh, currently, physicians in, in America pay too much of their income for malpractice insurance. Where does that money come from? It comes from you. When you go to the doctor's office, they have to raise their price to help pay for that insurance. If you're an OBGYN doc and you delivered a baby today, you have to have a tail on your insurance that will cover it until he's 18 years of age. So you have to pay 18 more years of malpractice after you retire. Okay? And we try to settle things with a blunt instrument. It's like trying to kill a man with a sledgehammer. Uh, most most malpractice suits are settled out of court. They're settled. And yet, uh, it requires enormous uh, malpractice insurance, and people have to defend themselves from that. 
So there needs to be some more rational system where people are held accountable for their action. If a physician makes a mistake, the patient should be compensated. They should get free care to repair the mistake. But suing the doctor is not the right answer. The doctor's mistake should be publicized and made known on the record, but uh, driving him or her out of practice would not be the answer. Uh, and having a crippling lawsuit uh, isn't the answer. So we, we have to have some form of tort and uh, of insurance malpractice. Okay, thank you very, very much. I know that we... I know that we've touched on an important topic. Um, there's obviously more to say if you have a specific answer or a specific question. Please feel free to bring it up later. Thank you very much for coming. Yeah.